Okay, this is the second part of the lecture for spinal cord injury nursing management. During the first 48 hours, spinal cord edema increases the level of dysfunction, particularly when the injury is at or above C3. Patient would experience labored breathing, their ABGs deteriorate, probably need mechanical ventilation, and respiratory rest is a possibility. The cervical and thoracic injuries cause paralysis of abdominal muscles and intercostal muscles. The patient cannot cough effectively, which leads to atelectasis or pneumonia. So as a nurse, it's important to regularly assess the breath sounds and breathing patterns, the blood gases, tidal volume, vital capacity, skin color, subjective comments, and amount and color of sputum. Complete injuries in the cervical region usually result in a total loss of intercostal and abdominal muscle control. Again, the higher the level of injury, the greater the loss of additional muscle control. An example is a complete injury between levels C3 and C5 loses all control of the diaphragm muscles. With a complete injury at level C3 and higher, the individual loses control of muscle groups that are needed for breathing. A ventilator is then needed to assist with breathing. Hypoventilation almost always occurs with diaphragmatic breathing. When a person inhales, it does not require any effort from the body's muscles. Normally, a person would use a combination of respiratory muscle groups to breathe air into the body. The diaphragm is a strong dome-shaped muscle that separates the abdominal and chest cavities and is normally the main muscle that you use when you inhale. The intercostal muscles are located between the ribs, and these muscles help to expand your ribs as you inhale. The neck muscles normally work to expand your upper chest when you inhale, and the abdominal muscles work with these other groups to help you breathe deeply and cough. The amount of muscle control that is lost after a spinal cord injury depends on the level of injury along with the completeness of the injury. The ventilator does the work of the absent muscles and forces air into the lungs. Many people with a C4 level of injury and even some people with C3 level of injury can eventually breathe without the aid of a ventilator or might only need it for part-time assistant. Those individuals with complete injuries above C3 would need a ventilator for full-time assistance. The amount of muscle control that is lost after a spinal cord injury depends on the level of the injury along with the completeness of the injury. Individuals with injuries below the T12 level do not lose any control of the respiratory muscle groups needed for breathing. This means the respiratory system is usually not affected by injuries in the lumbar or sacral regions of the spinal cord. Injuries in the thoracic area, T1 to T12, of the spinal cord affect the control of the intercostal and abdominal muscles. A lower level of injury, such as T10, results in the individual losing a smaller amount of muscle control. With a higher level of injury, such as T2, individuals will lose most of their intercostal and abdominal muscle control. The phrenic nerve stimulates the diaphragm to contract, and the nerve comes from the branches of the C3, C4, and C5 nerve roots. The phrenic nerve can be damaged by procedures that explore the neck and the upper back. There are two phrenic nerves, right and left. An injury to one or the other would paralyze a contraction of only one half of the diaphragm, but even hemiparalysis can significantly interfere with breathing for patients if they have lung disease. Loss of the phrenic nerve on either side results in paralysis of the diaphragm on that side, and paralysis of the diaphragm on one side would result in less inflation of the lung on that side. Whether this is physiologically significant, producing respiratory distress, hypoventilation, or hypercapnia, depends on other aspects of the patient's pulmonary physiology. Namely, do they have an underlying COPD, or emphysema, bronchitis, or pneumonia? The proper technique for testing proprioception is to ask the patient to close their eyes. Move the patient's toe up or down and ask them to identify the position of the digit. If lesions or tumor begin to press on the cord, then keep in mind that if the patient develops a new onset of weakness in both legs or decreased sensation and ability to move their legs, then this could be cord compression and would be considered a medical emergency to prevent permanent loss of function. The phrenic nerve is the nerve that comes from the cervical or neck region of the spine that supplies movement to the diaphragm and some sensation to the chest and upper abdomen. 
The body contains that right and left phrenic nerve, which then follows different paths, though they both begin in the C3, C4, and C5 vertebra of the neck. Of principal importance is a phrenic nerve role in causing the diaphragm to contract, which is a crucial step in the respiratory process. Like a pacemaker is used to stimulate the heart, a diaphragmatic pacemaker electronically stimulates the nerve, causing the diaphragm to contract and expand and allow the patient to breathe. A quad cough is similar to a normal cough, but only about 50% is powerful. By assisting in coughing, the cough will be more forceful and productive and able to both prevent and treat some respiratory complications by bringing up secretions normally present in the lung. Indications for an assisted cough are weak and ineffective cough and or excessive secretions. Reasons to avoid an assisted cough would be pain, internal problems such as abdominal complications, where pushing on the abdomen would cause more injuries. You would also avoid in chest injuries like broken ribs or flail chest. Following the procedure for an assisted cough, you would place the fist of one hand immediately below the breastbone and the heel of the other hand on top of the breastbone. The hands need to be over the diaphragm area. As the patient takes a deep breath and cough as they exhale the air, and once they exhale, push inward and upward as they cough. If on a ventilator, push during inhalation. An Ambu bag may be substituted for a ventilator for a stronger cough, and repeat as necessary with rest periods between efforts. An assisted quad coughing would be pressing down on the chest to force air and secretions out. Now this can be done while they're in bed or sitting up. And this is to assist coughing for patients with central nervous system disorders such as spinal cord injury who are unable to generate sufficient force to clear respiratory secretions. Be sure the brakes of the wheelchair are locked before assisting with the cough. If lung congestion is present, Assisted coughing is more effective when combined with postural drainage. The hand position could vary, but the hands must be at least below the ribs. Cardiovascular system. Any cord injury above the level of T6 greatly decreases the influence of the sympathetic nervous system. The heart rate can be slow, less than 60 beats per minute, because of an unopposed vagal response. Any increase in vagal stimulation can result in cardiac arrest, such as turning or suctioning. It is important to frequently assess the vital signs, anticholinergic for bradycardia, temporary or permanent pacemaker, and compression gradient stockings remove every eight hours for skin care. Prophylactic heparin or low molecular weight heparin can be given. If reflexes return after spinal shock and the injury level is T6 or above, the patient is at risk for peripheral vasodilation, which is decreased venous return of blood to the heart, decreased cardiac output, and IV fluids or vasopressor drugs may be required to support the blood pressure. An electrical stimulation leg ergometer, and this is used with persons with spinal cord injury because they often face the difficult but important challenge of maintaining cardiovascular fitness despite limited mobility and muscle function. One technology device that assists with this is this leg ergometer. This device is FDA approved and provides the benefits of improved range of motion, relaxes spasms, minimizes atrophy, and improves blood circulation. Peripheral vascular problems like DVTs and pulmonary embolisms are the leading cause of death. DVT assessments would include Doppler examination, impedance plethysmograph, and measurements of legs and thigh girths. The timely detection of peripheral vascular disease in spinal cord injury patients is difficult because the usual symptoms of claudication and rest pain are absent. There are times when the initial symptoms of peripheral vascular disease in spinal cord injury patients is advanced gangrene, so that healing primarily or following major amputation is either difficult and prolonged. In addition, sacral and ischial pressure sores common among spinal cord injury patients may be exacerbated and reconstruction made more difficult by peripheral vascular disease. Plus, this MOGRAPH sensor measures the impedance of body tissue in response to blood flow. This determines when a blood pulse moves past one or more fixed points. The idea is to measure the blood pressure using one of the several pulse velocity methods. Ideally, the sensor would be located on the upper arm at the same relative height as the heart. If the cord injury is above T5, Primary GI problems related to hypomotility may occur. Decreased GI motor activity contributes to development of a paralytic ileus, gastric distension, and a nasogastric tube may be needed to relieve gastric distension. Stress ulcers are common. 
Interabdominal bleeding may occur, and this is difficult to diagnose because they don't have pains from internal bleeding. The patient would have continued hypotension despite treatment. Decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit. An expanding girth may be noted. During the first 48 to 72 hours, the GI tract may stop functioning, and the nasogastric tube, after inserted, may lead to metabolic alkalosis. Decreased tissue perfusion may lead to acidosis. So it's important to monitor the electrolyte levels until suctioning is discontinued and the normal diet is resumed. Fluid and electrolytes would also need to be carefully monitored. Oral food and liquids can be given once bowel sounds are present or gas has passed. Patient is usually given a high protein, high calorie diet. Evaluate swallowing and high cervical cord injuries before starting oral feedings. And stress ulcers could peak between 6 to 14 days after injury. The GI bleeding is a potential complication of spinal cord injury from increased gastric acidity and the use of high-dose steroids. Patients require protection from the stress ulcers. The H2 blockers are used routinely to neutralize excessive acidity and prevent GI irritation and bleeding. In order to tell if a patient is bleeding, the abdomen should be measured every day during the acute phase to monitor for an expanding girth due to constipation or bleeding. Loss of body weight is common with spinal cord injury patients and their nutritional needs are much greater than expected for an immobilized person. They need a positive nitrogen and high protein diet. This helps prevent skin breakdown and infection and decreases the rate of muscle atrophy. The goal is preservation of muscle mass above the level of injury. Now get ready for a hard definition for a neurogenic bladder. A neurogenic bladder is a urinary problem in which the bladder does not empty properly due to a neurological condition. Any type of bladder dysfunction related to abnormal or absent bladder innervations like urgency, frequency, incontinence, inability to void, and high bladder pressures resulting in reflux to urine into kidneys. The voluntary control may be lost. Common causes for neurogenic bladder include Alzheimer's disease, diabetic neuropathy, multiple sclerosis, nervous system tumor, spinal cord injury, and stroke recovery. In patients with upper motor neuron problems such as spinal cord injury, stroking the inner aspect of the thigh, pouring warm water over the perineum, and tapping the bladder area are interventions that can initiate voiding. Medications that may help manage symptoms include oxybutynin or propantholine for overactive bladder, bethenicol for underactive bladder, and antibiotics if the bladder problems lead to an infection. The common complications from a neurogenic bowel include constipation, fecal impaction, and hemorrhoids. It is recommended that a protocol for constipation include the establishment of a balanced diet with adequate fluid and fiber intake, increased daily activity, and if possible, reduction or elimination of medication contributing to constipation. If these recommendations fail, Prokinetic medications may be used to promote transit through the gastrointestinal tract, such as Reglan. To minimize the development of hemorrhoids, oral agents are used to maintain soft form stool and minimize straining during bowel efforts. Once hemorrhoids have developed, topical anti-inflammatory creams or suppositories are suggested as early treatment. With the spinal cord injury, damage can occur to the nerves that allows a person to control bowel movements. If the spinal cord injury is above the T12 level, the ability to feel when the rectum is full may be lost. The anal sphincter muscle remains tight and bowel movements will occur on a reflex basis. This means that when the rectum is full, the defecation reflex will occur emptying the bowel. This type of bowel problem is called an upper motor neuron or reflex bowel. For a patient with a lower motor neuron injury, the resulting flaccid bowel may require the patient to be manually disimpacted. Scheduling toileting and massaging the abdomen from right to left also may be helpful. The patient is then put on a bowel program, which can be managed by causing the defecation reflex to occur at a socially appropriate time and place. Prevention of pressure ulcers and other types of injury to sensitive skin is essential. Teach these skills and provide information about daily skin care by careful positioning and repositioning that should be done every two hours. A pressure sore is any redness or break in the skin caused by too much pressure on the skin for too long a period of time. The pressure prevents blood from getting to the skin, so in essence, the skin dies. 
Normally, the nurse sends messages of pains or feelings of discomfort to the brain to let you know you need to change positions. But damage to your spinal cord keeps these messages from reaching your brain. For good skin care, maintain good hygiene. Wash with mild soap and water. Rinse well. Pat dry carefully but gently. Do not vigorously rub over the wound. Keep pressure off of the sore. Evaluate the diet. They should be getting enough protein, calories, vitamin A, and C, zinc, and iron. And all of these are necessary for healthy skin. Look at the mattress, wheelchair cushion, transfers, pressure releases, and turning techniques. These are all possible causes of skin breakdown. If the sore seems to be caused by friction, sometimes a protective transparent dressing may help to protect the area by allowing the skin to slide easily. The integumentary system experiences a loss of subcutaneous supporting and adipose tissue, as well as thinning of the skin with loss of elasticity. Skin tears and bruising become much more common with age. Poikilothurism, it is an adjustment of body temperature to room temperature. This occurs in spinal cord injuries because the sympathetic nervous system interruption prevents peripheral temperature sensations from reaching the hypothalamus. With spinal cord disruption, there is also decreased ability to sweat and decreased ability to shiver. The degree of poikilothurism depends on the level of injury. The temperature is largely external to the patient, so the nurse must monitor the environment and body temperature. Prism glasses help the patient who must remain flat to be able to watch TV. Every effort should be made to prevent the patient from withdrawing into themselves. Stimulate the patient above the level of injury, like conversation, music, aromas, interesting flowers. The goal is to prevent sensory deprivation. The nurse should encourage the patient to discuss their perceptions of the situation and the coping strategies that can be used. They should feel free to express personal feelings and emotions in an acceptable manner. Many begin with unacceptable behavior like excessive anger, verbal abuse, and it's important to attempt to redirect the behavior. A referral to a clergy, rabbi, or other spiritual leader may be needed to help them adjust. Autonomic dysreflexia is a massive, uncompensated cardiovascular reaction mediated by a sympathetic nervous system. If the reflexes return after spinal shock and the injury level is T6 or above, and this can occur in response to a visceral stimulation. Bradycardia is seen with patients that have T6 and above injuries. The most common cause seems to be an overfilling of the bladder. This could be due to a blockage of the urinary drainage device, bladder infection, like cystitis, inadequate bladder emptying, bladder spasms, or possibly stones in the bladder. The second most common cause is a bowel that is full of stool or gas. Any stimulus to the rectum, such as digital stimulation, could trigger a reaction leading to autonomic dysreflexia. Other causes include skin irritations, wounds, pressure sores, burns, broken bones, pregnancy, ingrown toenails, and appendicitis. Nursing is to elevate the head of the bed at 45 degrees or sit the patient upright. Check their blood pressure. Then check the sources of irritation like a kink foley, bladder, or bowel distension, or whatever is stimulating the skin. Immediate catheterization may be needed and then notify the physician. Teach the patient and family the causes and symptoms because a cerebral hemorrhage could occur if not treated immediately. This is an emergency situation and you may need to give medications to bring down that blood pressure. So here's a question. If the patient says they have a pounding headache, are you going to go check the fecal impaction first? Remember, that is an intervention. Where is your assessment? It's not enough to hear what the patient says their symptoms are. You have to assess. Your assessment is to check the blood pressure to determine if autonomic dysreflexia is happening. Then look at the other common causes like bladder distension, tight clothing, increased room temperature, fecal impaction, because if persistent, the patient could experience additional neurological injury. Precipitating conditions need to be eliminated and then physician is then notified. The resolution of spinal shock is signaled by the return of reflex activity. Note that spinal shock and neurogenic shock are not interchangeable terms and describe different pathologic phenomena. The first priority for a patient with a spinal cord injury is assessment of the respiratory status and airway patency. Patients with cervical spine injuries are particularly prone to respiratory compromise and may even require intubation.
rehab and home care organize around the individual patient's goals and needs. What the patient is expected to be involved in therapies, to learn self-care, just know this can be very stressful and they do require frequent encouragement. Spinal cord injury rehabilitation involves healthcare professionals and is initiated in the acute phase and continues with extensive and specialized inpatient services during the subacute phase. Inpatient rehabilitation is an important stepping stone towards regaining and learning new skills for independent living. Here, patients engage in an intensive full-day program with services which include nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, respiratory management, medical management, recreation and leisure, psychology, vocational counseling, driver training, nutritional services, speech pathology, social worker, sexual health counseling, assistive device prescriptions, and pharmaceutical services. Many times they will get angry at the healthcare workers. Be patient and just include them in the plan of care. They are most likely experiencing the anger phase of the grief process and allow them to express their anger, but you cannot take it personally. Rehabilitation continues with planning for discharge back to the community and finally reintegrating into former or new roles and activities within the community. Family and peers have important roles throughout the rehabilitative process. However, they would not be doing activities for the patient at home that they previously learned in rehab. This is why the family must be included in the rehab process. For spinal cord injury survivors who smoke, there's even more bad news because there's increased incident of skin sores, decreased ability to heal following skin surgeries, and a greater likelihood of atelectasis. This is a common reaction to when anyone says we're going to talk about sex. Sexuality and sensuality are an important part of the aging process. Most people want and need to be close to other people and to be touched both physically and emotionally. Spinal cord injury causes disruption to motor, sensory, and autonomic pathways, which depending on the level extent of impairment, impact significantly on many areas of a person's life, including sexual functioning. The initial response to a person that wants to know if they can still be sexually active after spinal cord injury is that there are options available and it will depend on the degree of injury and their individual feelings about sexuality. Ejaculation problems are the primary issues to be resolved for men who want to become fathers. About 90% of men with spinal cord injuries experience an ejaculation, which is an inability of men to ejaculate on their own during intercourse. Another potential problem is retrograde ejaculation, which is a condition where semen is deposited in the bladder instead of exiting the body through the urethra. Poor semen quality can also make it very difficult for men with spinal cord injury to fertilize the egg. Men with spinal cord injury make normal numbers of sperm, but the average number of modal sperm in semen from men with spinal cord injury is 20% compared to 70% in men in the general population. It is not known why there is an abnormally low sperm motility, but it does not seem to be related to level of injury, age, years post-injury, or frequency of ejaculation. Many spinal cord injury patients often find pleasure in holding hands, hugging, and kissing in addition to sexual intercourse. Many also experience a greater emotional closeness with their loved ones. Men with injuries above T6 are often able to have erections by stimulating the reflex activity. For example, stroking the penis will cause an erection. Ejaculation is less predictable and may be mixed with urine. Changes to sexual function usually refer to changes in arousal, erection in men, vaginal lubrication and accommodation in women. Sexuality is also inclusive of the psychological and physiological effects of loss of motor and sensory function, bladder and bowel control, and alterations to body image and self-esteem. Injury level and completeness of injury is needed to understand the male patient's potential for orgasm, erection, fertility, and the patient's capability for sexual satisfaction. Treatments for erectile dysfunction include drugs and surgical procedures, and many men with spinal cord injury and their partners want to have children. Although there are some couples who have little or no difficulty with fertility, Many men with spinal cord injury are unable to father children through sexual intercourse. It has been reported that women with spinal cord injury can experience orgasms following breast and upper body stimulation. Some women leave the catheter in place during intercourse. They tape it carefully out of the way on the lower abdomen or thigh and lubricate the exposed portion well so it will not accidentally be pulled out. 
However, if this is unacceptable to the woman or their partner, the catheter can be removed before intercourse and replaced afterwards. A spinal cord injury at any level will not affect a woman's ability to get pregnant. It is well known that stress of any kind, physical or emotional, can disrupt the menstrual cycle. Certainly, a traumatic spinal cord injury is stressful, and on this basis, there may be a temporary disruption of the normal cycle. About 50% of newly injured spinal cord injury women will not miss any periods, and most will resume regular periods within the first year. Ovulation may occur prior to the first period, so no one should never assume that pregnancy cannot result from sexual activity just because periods have not resumed. There is no evidence that women with spinal cord injury cannot or should not breastfeed if they so desire. So as a recap, when they're in the emergency room, the focus is to maintain the ability to breathe, prevent shock, Immobilize the neck to prevent further spinal cord damage. Avoid possible complications such as stool or urine retention, respiratory or cardiovascular difficulty, and formation of deep vein blood clots in the extremities. The patient may need to be sedated so that they do not move and sustain more damage while undergoing diagnostic tests for spinal cord injury. Medications like IV methylprednisone, like AIM, methopred, solumedrol, is a treatment option for an acute spinal cord injury. If methylprednisone is given within eight hours of injury, some may experience mild improvement. It appears to work by reducing damage to nerve cells and decreasing inflammation near the site of injury. It's not a cure for a spinal cord injury. The patient may need traction to stabilize the spine to bring the spine into proper alignment or both, and in some cases, a rigid neck collar may work. A rotor rest bed may also be used to help immobilize the body. Often, surgery is necessary to remove fragments of bone, foreign objects, herniated discs, or fractured vertebra that appear to be compressing the spine, and the surgeon may also need to stabilize the spine to prevent future pain or deformity. And in closing, you are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. C.S. Lewis